looking at basically different proof for the things that it says happen, happening, actually happening. Um, and the first stop we're at is the creation. Last week, or I guess it was two weeks ago, because um, last week was the bake sale. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about, um, really, we talked about the, the possibility of evolution, since it's such a big thing. And we basically come, came to the conclusion that the Bible allows for it to have happened or for it to not have happened. It really doesn't clarify. And you, it doesn't make you a non-Christian if you believe in evolution. And it doesn't make you anything else if you don't believe in evolution. It's fine. Like, it, you can believe in whichever. It's... There, there's there's not definitive scientific proof as to whether evolution is real or not, and there's not definitive biblical claim whether it's true or not. So remember all that and all the different uh, arguments that people get caught up in. And uh, much to <laughs> here's the thing: people will will tell you that if evolution is real, for instance, that that basically means that God didn't do it right the first time, and so he had to retry. Well, <laughs> that does not make sense. God does a lot of things by process. Like, for instance, when we're saved, are we instantly perfect? Yes. No. <laughs> Everyone besides Isaiah is, is a sinner. Isaiah alone is the perfect one. Um, but anyways, so, you know, saying that God does something by process doesn't mean that he's not doing it perfect. It just means that he's doing it by process. Like, that has no bearing on the argument at all. Um, so that takes us to, to this week. And... We're going to go over some things that maybe you haven't heard before, and so I want to make sure that if anything's not clear, please do stop me and ask. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. So, if you remember last week, we looked at, it really doesn't say how long these periods of time are. Right. Um, it's a very um, ambiguous word, and it can be translated in many different ways. And the things that happen in each of those days requires more than 24 hours. So there's just a lot of questions there. <laughs> and... Uh, it's important to remember that some questions we can't fully ever really know. Like, for instance, why did God do it like that? Well, I, I don't know. And the Bible doesn't clarify on a lot of things. So there's some questions that people ask that we can't possibly know. And I think that there's a few reasons for that. First off, the Bible says that God likes concealing things, you know, hiding things. Um, and another thing is, is it says that, um, you know, obviously he likes creating things and whatnot. So, you know, we don't really know... Any more than that. He's like, it's, it's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it now, this is something that John Walton, uh, who's a biblical scholar, brought up. And I, I want to mention it, but I don't necessarily agree with it, okay? First off, he, he claims that the, crea that the creation account in Genesis 1 is basically, it, it's not meant to be scientific, which I would agree with that because they hadn't, people hadn't had the scientific revolution. Um, and he claims that it wasn't necessarily meant to be chronological. Um, and that it was mostly just to teach teach us something about God, theologically driven. Um, and the reason why I'm not really into this is because, as we'll kind of see later, um, the Genesis account of creation is the only holy book that describes creation and it actually matches up with what science teaches too. It's the only, only pre-science book that does that, and it's also the only holy book that does that and i think that that's kind of something that people overlook and it's really not the smartest thing to overlook that because it is kind of a, a very important point so that kind of tends to make us think that it probably is chronological um but uh so okay uh and with that he kind of um brought up the idea that it was more of a topical thing that you know that they were organizing the information, not necessarily as to what actually literally happened, but just in a topical manner to basically prove the point that God was a creator. I don't really think that there's much basis to that because it, that kind of means that it's not really historical. And if it's not really historical, then how much value can it be? I mean, it could have just simply said, hey, God created everything. But it goes into greater depth than that while still not giving us all the answers. Um, and uh, so, okay. 
<clears throat> in verses 1, 1 through 1, 2. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So there's a few things to note. First off, in verse 2, it says that the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So God has created everything, right? And where is he? You know, sometimes we think that he's over in heaven speaking the words and things are happening on earth. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he, he was there at, at earth creating things real personal. It was an off way somewhere. He was there. And so that's kind of a, kind of a big point. Um, I'm, even in Christianity, we have this idea that God is off somewhere in heaven or something, wow. and he's saying something, and the commands are being carried out on earth. That's not what the Bible teaches. He was there. Um, another thing is some people teach that there's a break between verse 1 and verse 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. After a time, the earth was formless and void. and dark. So basically, there, were, there was maybe two earths. Um, there's actually something called a conjunction, which is basically and. And uh, in, in the Hebrew, it shows us the main thoughts that are being, that are going on by the use of the conjunction. So in other words, it's like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. It's a continuation of the thought. Um, it's, not, it's basically saying that um, – it's not necessarily saying that all these things happen at one time, but that the two thoughts are connected. Um, in other words, it could have taken a very long time for this to have happened, but – Verse 2 is a continuation of verse 1, okay? Um, and as far as how long did that take, we don't know. Uh, now, Diana asked uh, two weeks ago about the Big Bang. And this basically uh, – so, okay, science teaches us that there was nothing. And then out of nothing came a spark of something, and everything exploded from this point. It's called the singularity. Everything exploded from that point to create the vast universe, and that the universe is actually in a state of flux, uh, meaning that it is moving out from itself. So it basically, you can reduce by, – by analyzing space, you can reduce that back to its singularity to judge how old the Earth is, or create – I guess you could say the universe is. And that's the Big, the big Bang, this, this singular event that caused this, this explosion where absolutely nothing caused absolutely everything. And that's one of the one of the big questions that, that atheism has to resolve is how can everything come from nothing? And how come it stopped coming from nothing after it had already come? See what I mean? How come it isn't continually in that state of flux? And – well, not flux because it is in a state of flux. But I mean um, how come it's not continually spawning new things, new information? How come everything is so orderly? Um, how come gravity is even a thing? How come there's laws of the universe? How come all this just came into being? And so that's that's the big bang. Everything came from nothing. Um, now, something that is very important to note is verse 1 because people kind of miss over this. Sometimes people think that verse 1 is um, basically a summary of what happens. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and now in verse 2, we're going to look at how that happened. That's not how it's how it's claiming. Once again, remember the conjunction is there, okay? The and. And the earth… And the earth was formless and void, okay? So it's a continuation of the thought, so, so that don't get carried away with that. When it says um, God created the heavens, we're talking about space, we're talking about the sun, we're talking about the moon, we're talking about everything and the earth. Now, if you know anything about, about science, we know that the, si that the sun was created first, and then after some time, the earth was formed, and then from the earth, the moon came from the earth, okay? So some people have accused Genesis of not being scientific because it says that the earth was created before the sun, but that's not actually what it says. Read closer. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It mentions the heavens first. In other words, God created the sun before the earth. Okay. So, well, what about day, day uh, on down there and day two and four and stuff? Isn't the sun created later? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. We'll get there. Really back in. Um, by saying that God created the heavens and the earth, this is basically a blanket statement. In the beginning, God created everything. Now, we know through science that this actually took a really long time to happen. We're talking about millions and millions of years that, that for the sun to come from the Big Bang, for the earth to form from the, from the moon to come from the earth. It just took a very, very long time. And could God have caused it to all happen very, very quickly? 
Yes, yes, he could have. Obviously, I'm not discrediting God's power. But if you look at the rest of the, the rest of the thing, it makes it plain that God didn't just speak and things appeared. All throughout the Genesis account, it, it never once says that he just spoke a word and it all just appeared. You know, he says, let the, let the, let the earth produce plants. And then the earth produced plants. It didn't say that it just appeared out of nothing. He always does this little process of everything. And then for that matter, he took six days to do it. Obviously, he could have just spoken. Everything could have appeared in one moment, but that's not what Genesis teaches. Sometimes people think, well, if I don't believe that God instantaneously created everything just in the moment, then I am discrediting God. You're not discrediting God if God himself said that he didn't do it that quickly. Now, why didn't he take it, do it that quickly? Once again, this is one of those questions we don't know the answer to. God does things in his own time, and that's just how he works. There's a lot of things that we really, really, really wish that God would just do and get it over with, but he, he doesn't. Why would creation be any different than, uh, than, than that? So the idea here is that God created everything, the entire universe, so it skips over massive amounts of time in a, in a single verse. Kind of an important point there. Um, so then we get to verse 2. It says, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving out uh, moving over the surface of the waters. Now at this point, there's already wa water on the earth. There's a little bit of debate scientifically as to where the water came from. Some people think that it was here all along. Some people think that it wasn't and it was brought in by asteroids. Some people think some people think that it was uh, the Earth creates its and created its own through the process of it. We do know that the earliest Earth was uh, was uninhabitable. It was uh, basically a smoldering ball, <laughs> uh, very uninhabitable. And this you're going to find that the Bible says the exact same thing. Um, once again, science and the Bible really do agree, and it's very interesting how how people keep trying to make the Bible say something that it doesn't say. So uh, ultimately, the Bible doesn't say where the water came from. It's just at verse 2, the water's already there. So once again, this is this is skipped over massive amounts of time. And however the water came there, re regardless of whether it was uh, from asteroids or from others, an another source, it really doesn't matter. Um, well, another another uh, thought is that it's from the solar nebula. Now, that you might say be like me and say, well, what the heck is a solar nebula? Basically, sun go boom boom, earth come. Gas is in the it's just out there, okay? And this gas has water that collects on the earth. Let's that's a simplified version. Right. And uh, if you want a more complicated version, there's a lot of scientists out there who've written lot, written lots of papers about it. You can go read them. <laughs> um, but the moral of the story being the 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 Bible doesn't really clarify this. The Bible doesn't mention a lot of things because it's not important for the message of the Bible. Another thing the Bible doesn't really talk about is di dinosaurs. As far as we can tell, there is no mention of dinosaurs anywhere in the Bible. Um, it says giant creatures, but... Right, but the word that's used there um, is used in other places that we can translate as... There's Sometimes it's alligator or crocodile, sometimes it's hippo, and sometimes it's whale. And so we shouldn't take one word and say, okay, because this word is used here, when it's used in other places in the Bible to talk about alligators and hippos and those kinds of things, to then say it's talking about a dinosaur, when there's really no reason to translate like that. Um, and the reason why the Bible doesn't talk about dinosaurs is because it's not relevant to us. Yeah. It's cool to know about dinosaurs, but it's not relevant to us. It doesn't affect us. Yeah. The message of the Bible is not, here's a complete history of everything. Can you take care of that? Here's a complete history of everything. The uh, The purpose of the Bible is to... <laughs> I'll just wait. <laughs> well, anyways, the Bible was written instead to um, to teach us about God and, and to teach us things that were actually important for us to know. So remember that when you're reading Genesis, this is the question you should be asking, not... Does this ha is this congruent with science? Because it is. The question you should be asking is, what is God trying to teach me about himself in this story? Because that's the whole purpose of Genesis 1, is it's trying to teach us something about God. So we should be asking, what is it trying to teach us? Um, okay, so if you look in Job chapter 38, 4 through 9, it actually explains what's going on here with this whole... Um, 
uh, with this whole section here. Oh, excuse me. If I can ever find Job. Where'd you go, Job? Behind Psalms. <clears throat> uh -huh. right behind oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, like the pages or something? I got it, guys. I got it. Don't worry about it. Okay, Job 38, uh, starting in verse 4. And it, you can skip down to 9, but I'm going to read through. Uh, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? And then in verse 9, it'll, it'll talk about something that's very important for us tonight. But tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Now, this is God speaking to Job. So the question here becomes, is this something that somebody just came up with off the top of their head? Or is this really recording a conversation from God? Now, if you remember, we looked at Job already, and you know my feelings on this. So let's keep looking. Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning star sang, stars sang and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who enclosed the sea with doors when bursting forth uh, it went out from the womb? When I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. That's the part that I want you guys to pay attention. When I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. The Bible by its own testament says that when God first created the earth, there was a thick cloud that covered it and this thick cloud stopped the sun from reaching the earth okay it was just this thick darkness that covered it and when when the bible talks about it being formless and void it's talking about this this and if you re keep reading it says and darkness was over the surface of the deep well what causes darkness well job just said there was this thick cloud that covered the earth now, some people will tell you that there was no rain in the early earth, that the flood was the first time it rained. That's not what it says. If whoever told you that was, was just straight up lying. That's impossible scientifically anyways. Um, another thing that they, they'll teach you is that there was this canopy that was over the earth. That's just nonsense. Don't, don't listen to people who say those kinds of things. The Bible never once teaches those things. We'll look at them once, one, once a bit. Don't get carried away here. Um, okay. So there were thick clouds, and then... Um, uh, another point, if you want to read, I'm not going to read it there, but in chapter 38, verse 11, it talks about how God said other things besides the things that are mentioned in Genesis 1. It says in Job 38, 11, that God told told the water, go here and no further. But that, that talking is not recorded in Genesis. So we know that Genesis 1 doesn't record everything that God did in creation. Okay, There were things that he said and things that he did that are not here. Okay, Remember that. Um. Okay, so here's a typical breakdown of how Genesis 1 has been dealt with. Uh, the first three days have been kind of like seen as um, building the room, okay, setting things up for the creation. And then the second and third days, day four, five, and six, have been basically adding the furnishings to the room or filling the earth. Okay, Now, this is somewhat misleading because everything was created – The, the uh, let me see what I let me reword that. All the earth and the universe was created on day one. Okay, so it's a little bit misleading. However, it would be more accurate to say that in the first three days God gave purpose to the creation. That's a, that's that's a little bit different. Okay, so let me kind of go for it, and we'll go through verse five here. Then God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. Now we already know that the sun was created on day one. At the beginning, in verse 1, it says here, in the beginning, God created the heavens. So that kind of leads us with a little bit of a problem here. And for that, hold on. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. So this light didn't just appear. It came from one source. That one source was, of course, the sun. Because it says, let there be light, and let there be day and night. So in other words, the planet is revolving, and God is causing this light that did not come from him. Right. God is not emanating the light from himself, and it is not coming from something else. It says very, very clearly here, God, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, which means that it was coming from one source, that one source being the sun. Right? You look in the sky, you know it's the sun. You don't have to be told this. So then what happened between verses 1 and verses 3? 
or verse 3. Well, what happened there? Well, it seems like what he's saying is that when God said, let there be light, he wasn't saying, let the light appear, but rather, let the light hit the earth. In other words, God peeled back some of the cloud and let the sun actually hit the earth. Uh -huh. Now, this would be very um, – th this goes along with science, so it's not like yeah. there's no basis for this. Science is proving this. So if you, if you wonder how should we translate this, well, science is kind of helping us walk along with it. Um, and once again, the conjunction is used here that clarifies that it's a continuing thought. Then God said that there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Not that there, wa that there was no light before, but that the light was hitting the earth. So basically what you have is you have a shifting. Verse 1 is from the cosmic view. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. And then it shifts to earth. Right. And for, for, the rest, for the rest of the chapter, you're on earth now. Yeah. Okay. Verse 2. On the earth, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. What's happening out in space? Does not care. Does not care at all. The point is what's going on on Earth. Then God said, let there be light. So now on Earth, light is appearing, and the clouds are breaking. Light is appearing. Okay, all right. So there's a break in the clouds. The day is established. Um, so so time is getting getting established here. Um, but the sun was already there, so don't don't draw the wrong conclusion there. Um, so, so there are some more alternate pr possibilities. That I'm, I don't really think have any bearing to them, but I want you to be aware of them just in case. Um God gave the different commands on different days, and they started to happen, but it took a long time for them to finish happening. So basically, under this view, there were actually 27 24-hour peri periods of time, or I guess you could say six 24-hour periods of time, that God said something, and then it just took millions and billions of years for those for those commands to come to fulfillment. Which, I mean, wouldn't be beyond God. He says that a lot of times. You read in the Prophets, for instance, where he says something... And then it takes hundreds of years for it to happen. So, I mean, this wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility. I just don't think that's what's happening here because it, it, it kind of seems to imply that, once again, that, you know, it, it, we've already talked about that. Um, here's another thing is that the days were created with age. In other words, when God formed the sun, it was already old when he formed it. When he formed the earth, it was already old when it formed it. These kinds of things. But that doesn't really seem to fit because that's not really how God works, and it doesn't say that he worked with pre-existent matter. It says that God called it out of, you know, into existence. And the Big Bang, once again, establishes this, that things began to exist when they didn't begin to exist. So what caused them to happen? Well, the Bible says God. So that kind of one kind of doesn't really seem to hold any bearing either. Um, and it also kind of seems to, if, if the days were created with age... And because remember, it takes a long time for the light from stars to reach the earth, right? A long time, years and years and years and years of time. So, if we can't really know about things through observation, because everything we observe is a lie, then how can we really know about God through His through His creation? See, the Bible says one of the key ways that we know about God is through the creation. But if everything we observe in the creation is a lie, then how can we possibly know about God? That means God has made himself so hidden that we can't really know him, which means that his word lies when it says we can know him by his word, by his, by his creation. See, that doesn't make sense. But if it is how it, has, it is observed, then we can actually know who God is. Um... And then another another quote, which once again uh, I I've already said that I definitely do not agree with it, is that the events were rearranged. I do not believe that at all. I believe that Genesis one is a literal chronological account of what God did, and I think that um, that takes a lot of faith to believe that. But mm -hmm. honestly, I believe that science agrees with it too. So I think that it doesn't require quite as much faith as saying that everything just began to exist for, from nothing for no reason. Without God, I mean that doesn't really make sense. So, just a few more things and then we'll stop. Um, how old is the Earth? This is a thing that goes on and on and on and on. We can date things, and our dating shows that it is billions of years old. So there's that. Um, then there's the issue of how long things take, like where it says that God caused plants to grow. It takes a while for a seed to germinate and then grow. Anybody who's ever farmed will tell you it, it takes time. Uh -huh. So there's that. 
another thing is it takes time for the heavy elements to to be on Earth from the sun. That, that takes a long time for that to happen. And the sun has to be so old for that actually to begin to happen. Remember when we were looking at the creation before, um, I brought this point up. That, it that the sun has to be a certain age before heavy elements can form. And so seems how the heavy elements have formed on Earth, that would mean that the sun would have to be a certain age. See what I mean? Um, and then we're seeing this process repeated in outer space. It's not like we live in a vacuum where all that exists is the Earth. We can analyze the rest of the universe, and we see the same thing happening over and over again. Um, now, this is what trips me out. What if God decides to raise up another Earth before this Earth is destroyed, um, you know, in the end times? Right. That's going to be a trip if that happens. Now, yeah. we, we won't live to see that happen because space, space right. it just takes too long to travel anywhere. But that would be a trip if God decided to do that because, wow. Anyways, um, and then obviously there's the issue of how long it takes for the light from stars to come. So all that kind of adds up, and I could give more examples but basically the the bare root of this if we can know god through observing the world and if what we observe is actually true like he says it's true then that would mean that the earth is very very old we're talking about millions and millions of years old people like ken ham who believe in a young earth they say something like this see your dating methods are not perfectly accurate and you can't date things are that are excessively young therefore the Earth isn't old. Well, see, the problem with conspiracy theories is that there's an element of truth in it. Ken Ham is right. Dating methods are not exactly 100% precise. Right. There are mistakes to them. However, it is the only dating method we have. Yes. Ken Ham has refused to give us any other scientific evidence for dating anything. And everyone who believes in a young Earth, they're faced with this exact same problem. There's no evidence to support a young Earth. None. And yet they say, well, don't believe the old Earth dating because it's not 100% accurate. Well, at least it's well, something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just because something's not perfectly accurate doesn't mean it's not true at all. Right. It's not either or. It can be, you know, maybe we don't know have all the answers. But yes, it does seem to be this more so than that. Were you going to say something, Nicole? There, there's a lot of people that complain that there's, we only have one way of doing things, but they refuse to give us another way of doing things. <laughs> right, right. They won't give us an alternative option. Yeah. Um, so then that brings us to another problem that if you are familiar with public school, you, you've already probably encountered this. Did people originate in Near East or in Africa? Because the Bible says in the Near East, and your your history and science books will say Africa. Well, which is it? Well, see, it's not quite that simple. See, they believe that man evolved from monkeys. Now, you know that I believe in evolution in part. Right. In part. I don't believe in the theory that they're teaching in school, but I do believe that, that species do adapt with time. We've seen that happen with dogs, for instance. Right. We've seen that happens with chickens. It, animals do adapt. I mean, okay. But – that doesn't mean that I believe that monkey, the animal, that people came from came from animals. I don't believe that. I think that's nonsense. There's completely different species of uh, right. Well, so basically, what what an atheist says is because my because microevolution happens. Microevolution is a species making little changes to adapt to its situation. Okay, um, throughout successive generations. For instance, people are now taller than they used to be. Okay. Yeah. That's that's just a good example of a microevolution. That since microevolution happened, that would mean that macroevolution, which is one species of becoming another species through time, that means that macroevolution had to have happened, and that's it doesn't follow. Just because a species adapts through time doesn't mean that it turns into a completely different species. And then you still have the problem of where did that where did that new information come from? You know, because okay, let's say originally you know life had this DNA code. And then it mutated, and that caused a greater DNA code. All all mutations do is they limit the, the genetic code. Right. So to say that it mutated the other way and caused new information that caused more species, that doesn't fit. It, it doesn't fit. And, and there's a lot of um, uh, – Professor uh, – I think his name's Behe or something like that. 
Anyways, uh, he's talked about this a lot, and he has quite a few books about it. If you want some recommendations, I can give them to you. But so basically, since they believe that man came from apes, and this ape ancestor, which we've only found like one or two of these things that were supposed to have evolved from, you would think that there'd be more of them. Uh, since they believe that, and those were found in Africa, that that means we came from Africa. Well, see what I mean? That doesn't quite fit. Um, and then there's the issue um, that that people are kind of forgetting. People all lived in one place, and then the flood happened, and then they split from that place. Yeah. So after the flood, yes, it is fully possible that they went from where they landed after the flood down to Africa, and they started spreading out from there. That's fully possible. But remember that the flood would have wiped out most of what was happening with that civilization. Now, we'll get to the flood later and the proof of the flood and, and all that stuff. Don't worry about that. But right now, um, the, main story, the main story is this. We keep finding remains of, of humans older and older and older. Now the oldest remains that we have in, in Asia is, I think, if I remember correctly, 160,000 years old remains of humans. So that would mean that the flood happened over 160,000 years ago because it would have had time to travel from Near East to Asia. See what I mean? There would have had to be some kind of time there. So just because we haven't found the proof yet doesn't mean that we for sure came from Africa. See what I mean? That There's a lot of assumptions that's going in, into process here. In fact, they did a study where they um, dated women back to a common to a common ancestor and that common ancestor was about 200,000 years ago so that would say that the flood was probably 200,000 years ago and then however long before the flood adam and eve were which probably wasn't millions of years ago but still um okay so then uh, there's a main point in genesis 1 that is often overlooked uh by us modern people because we don't believe in this so but in the ancient near east earth was created through a cosmic battle with the goddess tiamat and uh, basically Goddess, sex with another, with a god, minor gods created, battle, that's how creation happened. This, this cosmic battle between these gods. And um, I'm way oversimplifying it. You can you can read that in the Enuma Elish is what it's called. Enuma Elish. Um, it's the I think it's Babylonian if I remember correctly. Um, it's their account of the of creation. But anyways, in Genesis what we see is we don't see any battle. And we see God intimately um, involved with his creation, and we see him doing it by his power, not by some battle. And you see him bringing the things out of nothing rather than having to use what, what they used Tiamat to, to – you know, it's a, it's, it's a story. M more a story being that God just simply caused it to appear rather than having to use a, a dead god or goddess. And so that's kind of an important point that we overlook because we didn't live thousands of years ago. Uh, another thing is that – um, people are not an afterthought. Now, people were created last, yes, just like uh, science once again shows us that, that humans were l later in the scene. That's that's totally congruent with science. But that, according to the Bible, that doesn't mean that we were an afterthought. It means that we were the final creation. And then it talks about us being – well, we'll get into that later when we get to it. So now once again, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, okay, so then that brings us to the question that – okay, so if – Genesis just skim simply skips over uh, dinosaurs, then what the heck, uh, where, did, where and when did the dinosaurs go? So the, the dinosaurs uh, died somewhere um, between day uh, – hold on, I'm trying to find here. Uh, somewhere between days um, – where is it? If I remember correct, it's day four and five. Third day, okay. Do, 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 do. There's even a fourth day. Okay, yeah, somewhere between days um, five and six, uh, the dinosaurs died. So that means, okay, so is there any biblical warrant for this? Actually, yes, the Bible actually tells us that God does this. Check this out Psalm 104, which is a psalm about creation. And it says in 29 through 30, it says this. You hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to the dust. It's talking about it's talking about creation. And then verse 30, you send forth your spirit, they are created, and re you renew the face of the ground. So what I just said was that God raises up life, 
lays it down again, and then raises it up again. He's He causes life to come and go. So once again, let, let's look at how this has played out in history. The dinosaurs died before people were, were ever on the scene. Um, a lot of animals have, have um, what's it called, uh, become extinct. Even since the Ice Age, a lot of animals have, have gone extinct. You know, And the Earth has obviously had a lot of different weather fluctuations and whatnot. And so all this goes to show, yes, science definitely backs up this claim that the Bible makes that uh, God does raise up and, and, and put down again. So this is kind of an important point when we're talking about dinosaurs. Now, why did God cause the dinosaurs to die up before people? I don't know. Once again, there's often times that God doesn't tell us why. He doesn't even tell us that there were dinosaurs. So why would he bother telling us why he killed them? <laughs> See what I mean? Uh, with, which, once again, remember that God created the lion. So God created the creation with death in it. Okay, once again, because if he told Adam, hey, you're going to die if you do this, and God didn't, and, and Adam didn't know what death was, you see, that just doesn't fit. Yeah. So, uh, okay, we're going to stop there. Um, yeah, any questions? We kind of went over a lot of stuff. No questions? If you think of something throughout the week, please do ask. If you want it answered anonymously, there's the box right there. Um, what we're going to find out as we go through and finish up looking at the creation is the proof of Genesis 1 actually happening is science. Science is affirming what Genesis 1 says. The more we, the more we find out with science, the more, the more it backs up Genesis 1. That is the only creation account... That, it, that, it, that backs up science. This is kind of an important point. Oh, okay. out of all the different creation stories? Right, right. Out, out of all the different creation stories, the Bible is the only only one. The Bible is the only, only holy book that, that mentions this and that is scientifically being proven. Right. So, you know, that's an important point. Now, once again, to say that the Bible skips over things is not the same as saying that it's not true. Right. So those are two different statements. Yes, the Bible does skip over things. The Bible skips over people in the, in the genealogies, too. We'll get to that later, too. Remember that. The Bible is not a complete record. God recorded certain things because he wanted us to know certain things. Remember that. Okay, so we're going to stop there. Hopefully I've caused more um, more thinking where you're going to be questioning some, some old prejudices you've had, some old thoughts you've had. That, that's a great thing. When, when we get too set in stone on something where we're just reading through the Bible and not learning anything, that, that's not a good thing. You want to be in a place where you're challenging your beliefs. Um, I mean, this is one thing I think Ken Ham could really benefit. If you guys know, don't know who Ken Ham is, he puts all kinds of stuff out there about Young Earth. He, he's the one who made the Ark in Kentucky or whatever. Um, it's that guy. Um, you know, and this is one thing he does. He's a website called Answers in Genesis. Answers, yeah, Answers in Genesis. And, uh, you know, he, he, the problem with him, oh, I'm standing on the word, but the word doesn't say that. You're teaching people that it says this. And here's the thing about, here's the thing that makes Ken Ham so destructive. He teaches you, you have to believe in this when it's his own opinion. It's not what the Bible says. <laughs> like, here's another th thing. The Bible actually says that the flood was not over the whole earth. It says in the, own, in the, in the Bible itself, it says that the flood did not go over the whole earth. Yet people like Ken Ham completely ignore that and say, no, it was a global flood. It was not a global flood. The Bible says it was not a global flood. It's kind of an important point. We'll get to that later. And, it, and see, that's something I was taught growing up at the Christian school. Yeah, for whatever reason, Christian... But I thought it was because it said that it was... Most people think it was because they've been taught for so long by people like Ken Ham that if you believe in the Bible, you have to believe when the Bible doesn't say no, that. that's what I took out of the Bible, though. Yeah, I, I know, and it's that has more to do with translation than anything. Oh, we'll get to it when, when we get to the flood, and I'll, and I'll kind of explain it. Um, and we'll look at the different proof of the flood actually happening, because these are things that the atheists are really going to prey on. You know, they're going to they're gonna prey on things that are mistranslated and mistaught for so long that they're just going to latch onto it. And it's like, well, no, if you actually read what the Bible really says, you know, we can stand in faith on these things. We're not, we're, It's not blind faith, guys. This is proven. It's blind faith if you don't know. <laughs> like, for instance, if Jesus would have said, just believe that I rose from the dead, but there were no witnesses. That would have been blind faith. There were all kinds of witnesses. So, okay, so anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm getting rabbit trail here.